Welcome to the Best Music Podcast, where we see behind the curtain and discover the hidden habits and success secrets of noteworthy music makers so you, the listener, can speed up your journey to your dream music goals by taking what you need from their wins and lessons learned along the way. I'm your host, Dan Spencer, and this week's featured guest is Benjamin Koppel. Benjamin Koppel, Danish saxophonist and composer, is one of the most award-winning musicians of his generation known for his versatility and virtuosity. Also a renowned composer, Koppel is the grandson of noted Danish classical composer Hermann D. Koppel. His father, Anders Koppel, is well-known and successful Hammond organ player and a composer. The family is full of music and creativity. The prizes Benjamin has won so far include the Palais Bars Jazz Prize, the Jacob Gade Prize, Halstebro Music Prize, and others. He was also named Knight of France, Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres, in 2011 for his musical work. Couple has released more than 60, guys, not 16, 6060 albums as a jazz soloist, along with some of the biggest international jazz names, including Joe Lovano, Kenny Werner, Charlie Mariano, Daniel Humier, Phil Woods, Alex Riel, Larry Goldings, Randy Brecker, Peter Erskine, and many Many, many others. Couple has collaborations with a number of high class classical soloists, including Katrine <laughs> Gislinge, Michaela Petri, Heinrich Dam Thompson, Inger Dam Jensen, and others. His saxophone can be heard on a large number of albums, including Moon Jam, the best selling Scandinavian instrumental band with several albums to their credit, including platinum albums. Dancer Orchestre, Rugsted and Kurzfeld, Maria Montel, Marie Carmen Koppel, Hannah Boel, Alberta Winding, San Salamonson, and soundtracks for several feature films, documentaries, cartoons, and ballets. He has jazz groups and plays classical pop, R&B, and folkloric music, and almost anything in between. As a composer, he writes in those genres and is not afraid to take on large-scale projects and compose music for theater to put together two festival programs per year and, get this, write a book whenever there's a break. Since 2012, Benjamin has been a member of the trio Couple Collie Blade Collective, together with bassist Scott Collie and drummer Brian Blade. Their new album, Perspective, is out now wherever you listen to music. You can listen to the album and find out more at BenjaminCoppel.com. That's B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-K-O-P-P-E-L.com. Benjamin, thank you so much for taking the time out of today to come chat with me. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. And thanks for that introduction. Oh, Benjamin, all I did was read some of the amazing things you did. And that being said, everyone should know I had to cut your bio in about half because otherwise we'd be sitting here for about 10 minutes while I just read through <laughs> everything you've done, man. It's like... I'm, I'm glad you made the cut. <laughs> so, Benjamin... You play in so many diverse genres. You've grown up with music. You've been eating, breathing, living, sleeping music for so long and at such a high level and across such a spectrum of different categories. What is one thing that you have found to be true across all genres and all styles of music? Well, I guess it's pretty basic stuff, but. Um... Be true to yourself and be open-minded, open-hearted. Go into any musical collaboration um, with the uh, task of giving, not taking, which means giving space, not taking up space. Um, and, you know, be open to whichever idea, musically or, you know, atmospherically or whatever that comes from the other musicians and be open to, you know, throw away your own ideas and go with which would ever throw, uh, you know, collective flow there would be. So I would guess, I, I would I would say the most important thing is be true to yourself and be open-minded and give, not take. 
So there's an interesting juxtaposition within what you presented, not in the way you presented it, but for some people, because some people might have the idea of being true to yourself means you have to do everything the way that you think is right, right? Some people think that that's what being true to yourself means, but you're saying this is a different way of being true to yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that difference, Benjamin? Definitely. I think um, to be true to yourself, you have to, um, you know, not pretend that you're somebody else. I mean, if I go on stage uh, with Chris Potter, whom I played with, uh, for instance, I don't try to be Chris Potter because if I try to be Chris Potter, I would fail <laughs> dramatically. So the only thing I can do is go up there and tell my own story. And in order to, to make my story become uh, interesting and relevant to whichever musical setting I'm in, I have to um, be open to give my story to other people, to other musicians, and let them lead the way and do whatever with it they feel is the right thing for the music collective that we're in right now. So I think true to yourself means be whoever you are and don't be afraid to, to show that you're not Herbie Hancock. Only Herbie Hancock is Herbie Hancock. So if you try to be Herbie Hancock, you will fail dramatically. <laughs> but if you are yourself, then you would have, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And if you tell your own story and don't try to tell other people's stories, then you are true to yourselves. So I think that's a very important um, issue for me and, you know, in, in working with, with the music as a, a, a art form, which is based on dialogue, basically. So, um, so that's, that's, you know, that, that's the, the term for me, you know, to, to be true to yourselves. And then the other thing is music is never about me and it's never about you. It's about what we can, you know, create together. Because you can create your music, I can create my music, but, um, but together we can create so much more than what, you know, if the, the old saying one plus one equals three is actually true when it comes to music. Because if we put on all our sentiments and emotions and thoughts and heart and love for music together, then it becomes much bigger than either of us. So the music should never be about you. It should never be about me. It should be about what we are uh, aiming at together. And then so, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> but, but you have to take those chances. Could you talk a little bit about something you just mentioned, that music at its most fundamental level is a conversational art form? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, for me, music is it's, it's a dialogue. And there are different layers of dialogue. There's the, the dialogue between the musicians and the audience. But there's also also the dialogue between in between musicians and even the dialogue with yourself and your instrument. So we have different layers of dialogues. And if they all come together, when they all come together, that's where the true art really arises and, you know, becomes um, so powerful and meaningful and somehow can change, if not the universe, then small pieces and parts of the universe. That's my, you know, belief anyway. Um, I think we cannot, you know, make peace and make all the bad go away with music, but we can help balancing the evil and the ugly by creating something that's beautiful or something that depicts the, the awful in, in a way that we, you know, get something to think about. So, um, it's a, it's a, there's a small, tiny hope in there. Um, so yeah, that's for me, that's kind of the dialogue is so important because, um, and again, if you go into a dialogue with a good friend or your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, then you know you have to listen to the other part in order to get a dialogue going somewhere that neither of you had ever intended it to go. That's where we can learn from each other. And the same goes for music. When we get into a musical dialogue, if we are open to whatever comes from the other musicians, then we can go places that we hadn't even, you know, practiced or rehearsed or thought of before. And that's where the, the dialogue become, becomes so important in, in creating true art. Um, the dialogue with the audience is also super important because for me, we don't play for ourselves because if we play for ourselves, then we become, you know, super um, self-imposed. We think about, oh, now we play for ourselves and we try to maybe, you know, force the dialogue into a direction where it really didn't want to go. But if we always remember that there's a, audience that has, you know, they have invested time, maybe even money, maybe they traveled far to come to the concert or they spent money 
find an album or a LP or whatever, then we have to honor that um, with, you know, doing our best and, and remembering that what we do hopefully might be relevant to them. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the dialogue with the instrument, which is an ongoing and and beautiful and terrible <laughs> task, which, you know, can last a lifetime and even 10 lifetimes. Uh, for me as a saxophone player, I, I will never be finished with, you know, get to a point where now I know everything. Not at all. Every day I know less and less, uh, even though I become, I, I hope I've become a better musician and a better man. I know less and less of the instrument and I've become more and more increasingly, um, you know, curious about all the different sounds and ways of approaching the instrument. So, so that's, that's an ongoing dialogue as well. So um, for me, those three layers of dialogue are super important in, in playing music. One interesting point is, like you said, when you are making music, even if it's not going to stop all wars and human conflict, you're making a difference, maybe even not in the listener, but you're making a difference in yourself by being the person who shows up to make music with that intention, by, by being an agent yourself in the world and deciding for yourself that that's your mission is going to create so many downstream effects in how you live your life and everyone who comes in contact with you. I, I, I definitely hope so. And I mean, we have to, um, I, had, I had a good friend, he's, he passed now, unfortunately, a few years ago. But we had often when we met, and we met, you know, sometimes we didn't even meet like four or five years. But then we met and we always talked about, for some reason, that we had to do our best in any circumstance, in, in any which way, you know, any which um, position in life, do our very best. And that's actually, that's, that's where life really becomes important. Because if we don't do our best, then doesn't really matter. So whenever we, you know, cook a dish or we talk to our parents or we play music or we, you know, walk the street, let's just, you know, try to at least aspire to do our best. And when we do that in music, magic happens because to me, music and nature is magic. I'm not a religious man, but I really believe in music and nature as such powerful forces that it can, you know, transcend whatever mind capability a, a single man has or a woman, you know, but person. So for me, um, we have so much magic at hand. We just have to lend ourselves to it, if it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> that is beautiful. Going back to the idea of the three ways of perceiving music as being a conversation, I think that that very easily lends itself to an improvised art form and immediately lends itself to improvised art form. Would you mind, as a thought experiment, Benjamin, walking us through these three levels, but for example, taking a piece of music that was written hundreds of years ago, has been performed thousands of times, how then do we perceive these three levels? Is it all exactly the same or is there nuance within this? Because I think we can agree at the instrumental level, there still is going to be that dialogue. Totally. Totally. So that, that's the easy one. But I think, you know, I have, uh, I have a friend, Mahan Esfahani, which is one of the, you know, biggest talents and, and superstars of cembalo playing in the world. And he's very, you know, um, working a lot with ancient music, Bach and whatever came before Bach. And so, and, and we talked about this and back in the day, first of all, there was a lot of improvisation in the music, even back then. Uh, I mean, the cadenzas, they were improvised. Even at Mozart's time, the cadenzas were improvised. And then later on, they began writing the cadenzas down and suddenly it became more like the same piece every time. Um, but even with, you know, thoroughly uh, composed music, through composed music, there are a lot of ways to really improvise because every time you take a phrase or melody line or a whole movement, there are so many ways to to phrase it and to make it your own. Um, so I would I would you know put it at the same level as improvising if it's in the hand of a really good musician. Um, an example could be uh, Brahms Piano Concerto, Concerto for Piano and Orchestra, which you know 
can divert. I have, have I have many recordings of this piece because I love it, and it can divert with you know uh, as much as eight or ten minutes in length, which is solely due to the choice of tempo, which is the conductor and the soloist. Hopefully, they agreed on something, but also in in terms of phrasing and how you um, you make the music your own. So they even with true composed music and when all the notes are there, you still have to sh shape every note in terms of, the, mm -hmm. you know, making it your own. So for that matter, I believe, I strongly believe that there's a lot of improvisation in, for instance, classical music or, you know, written music. Um, and it's another kind of improvisation than in jazz where we, you know, can get up and we have a, a uh, uh, mutual or you know common uh, vocabulary everybody knows first hundred standards so we can just go up and play like 10 concerts which with, with different sets uh without agreeing on anything and then hey let's pick them or somebody just begins to play one um so we have another way of approaching improvisation but if we get down to every note and phrasing and melody line i think it's the same thing that goes on for the classical music as well would you say it would be fair to say that the creativity in classical music is not necessarily inventing the new notes, but it's taking the same notes and having to be almost, we could call this a deeper creativity because you have to do it in a new way. If you're thinking about bringing your voice to something, right, and having exactly. something unique to say, it's like, well, we have hundreds of recordings of this one piece and you can hear all the ways everyone exactly. said this. Now you've got to go find a new way of saying that. Totally, exactly. And, um, and you know, if you take like Duke Ellington, which is one of my many heroes, but definitely one of my big heroes, if you, I have a lot of recording, like hundreds of albums with Ellington's uh, orchestra through his, you know, span of, of career and take us all like Mood Indigo or, you know, one of his hits, the musicians in his band, they often played the same solo every night, almost. And if you have live recordings from with Ellington band, you know, some of the solos, they became like, you know, a standard obligatory solo for whoever had that seat in the band 20 years later. So, but still they made it their own and, you know, in phrasing. So if you take Mood Indigo, it's almost note by note, the same solos as in the original recording, because it was perfect. It was a hit, but still they make it their own. And, and because it's jazz, we think, oh, it's improvised, but it's, it's really it became part of the melody. And in that respect, it, it becomes the same as a, you know, a Beethoven sonata or whatever. At, in, in the act of creating music, after inspiration or at the times when inspiration is not there, when we're making conscious artistic choices, what do you think it is a good idea to optimize for? Well, um, I had a very good teacher one back in the day when I played drums when I was a little kid. And he said it was all about getting as much knowledge as possible. And then when in the situation of playing, it all became down, came down to forgetting all the knowledge and just play by heart. So it's, it's a, it's a two headed dragon. If you will, you have to learn as much about your instrument as, as many tools as possible concerning scales, rhythm, harmony, structures, uh, all that. Uh, and of course your instrument. I mean, every, whichever instrument you have to know it as much as, as deep as possible, as deeply as possible. But then at the same time, when you get into the musical situation where you actually have to perform and create music with somebody and, and hoping it becomes art, then you have to forget everything, forget all the tools and hope that you can activate them instinctly so um so i think it's it, it has these tools uh well two paths really which are on one hand very opposite but at the same time it has to go hand in hand uh in order to have as many tools as possible to express yourself and be um in contact with your spontaneous combustion really but uh, but you can only do that if you know your tools by heart, it's just there and you can just pull it out, yeah, not even thinking about it. So in the moment where we find ourselves in, 
whatever state where we're not inspired or we're not finding our way to that flow and we're not finding a way to that sort of riding the wave of consciousness and letting go at the same time that is inspiration. When we're not there and we're having to use our brain, we're having to use the technique, the fundamentals, the knowledge that we have, what do you think would be the highest level thing for us to optimize for? So are we thinking about optimizing for emotion? Like, should all the decisions we make be filtered through, how am I getting the emotion to translate? Should all the decisions be filtered through, how can I make the most money with this music? In those <laughs> moments, right? Yeah. In, these, in those yep. moments, for you, from your personal philosophy, what's the highest level thing that we should filter artistic decisions through? Well, I have definitely never made any musical choices where if, for its money. It, I mean, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't go like it, and it has it doesn't inspire me at all. So what inspires me is the music and the magic of music and collaborating with other hopefully better musicians than myself. I've always tried to get in in situations where I can meet people that are know a lot of things that I don't know because then I can learn from them. And I've been fortunate enough to be um to have the opportunity to play with a lot of musicians who knew so much or know so much about music that I don't and in that way I've been learning. So I think for me the the biggest aspiration is to learn always. And then I you know what there was uh, an American piano uh, pianist, Butch Lazy, who used to be the um, accompanist for Sarah Vaughan and a lot of different people. Amazing pianist. He lived in Copenhagen for many, many years. Um, and he always said, if you hear something, play it. Now, that's a pretty good advice, piece of advice, because if you hear something inside of you, somewhere, wherever the music, you know, comes from in you, it could be in the stomach or the heart or the brain or the ear or whatever, the feet, if you tap it and, oh my God, this moves me. I, have, I hear something. I have to play it. And then, but at, you know, at the same time, if you don't hear it, then don't interfere. Then maybe let it, let, let somebody else, um, then maybe let somebody else take care of it for a minute and see what comes uh, next. And maybe in a minute, you'll hear something. And if you hear something, play it. So I think that's pretty pretty strong piece of advice, even though it's very, very basic. It's um, so, so you don't have to force it. It's, if you force your, your way of expression, it's rarely a good thing. It rarely gives a, a good result, uh, neither for you or the audience or the other musicians, I might add. So I think, Humility is, it comes somewhere, you know, at the end of this piece of advice, it, it speaks to us about being humble in the, uh, in whichever occasion we play music. And, um, humility doesn't go very well with, you know, aspiring to earn a lot of money, for instance. Um, and, and that's another thing to that. You can never figure it out in beforehand. I mean, you can't make a hit if you want to make a hit, but you can make as good a piece of music as you can if you really love it and put all your heart and emotion in it. And then maybe if a lot of different uh, parameters come together, maybe it'll become a hit, but you can't figure it out. You can't force it. And if you try to, uh, you know, make a, I don't know, make a song like Thriller, you can never do it. Or Barbie Girl, which is written by a Danish group. You're like, you, you can't write another Barbie Girl, but you can make a song, uh, which might you can't, you know, cancel the violin or whatever. Watermelon Man, you can't, you can't do another Watermelon Man. It's 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 it doesn't exist. But you can make your own music, and then for the the whatever comes after, if it becomes a hit or something that pays your bills or whatever, that's beautiful. But it that should never be the. Uh, the topic or the, the, the goal of you uh, when working with creativity, in, in my opinion. So what I'm hearing from you is that I'm asking the wrong question. And that the question I asked you is in the moments when we're not feeling inspired, what should we be doing? How should we be filtering our decisions? And what I hear the answer from you is being, and please correct me if I've got this wrong, I hear the answer is being, wait until you are inspired to go back. And I, like, if you would, need that yes. moment of rest, something is telling you, be it your body, your mind, your emotional state, something is telling you because you're not in that state that maybe you need a break from trying to be in that state. Yeah, and maybe you can find that inspiration while doing the dishes mm. or cooking or walking in the dark or, you know, uh, 
I, I know a lot of musicians who feel that if they get to that state where they're not inspired, oh, then I have to practice more. I have to practice more. And usually what I say to them is like, hey, walk the dog, do the dishes, um, clean your closet or whatever, you know, do something else that makes your mind less um, preoccupied with not being inspired. Because um, music it's, is, is part of life. It's not life itself. Um, my very good friend, Kenny Werner, always says, it's only music. And it is. And if you look at it at, as only music, then it becomes, you know, a, a rich and powerful and magic and huge. But if you look at it as this is the only thing I can spend my time on, then the rest of your life becomes less important or too little important and that's actually where you will get your, you know, emotions and your experiences that create the stories that we want to hear from you as a musician. So I think, you know, having a, a whole life, uh, and it might sound new age, like, which is not my intention at all, but having a whole life where, you know, you seek happiness and seek the good and seek to do good things in a lot of different things aspects of life, not only music, that will create inspiration in your music life. That's my, um, my, my definite, uh, you know, opinion on that. So I think, yes, the, the, <laughs> to make a, shit, the, uh, a short answer to, to my long, you know, whatever, I think you're right about, you know, if you're not inspired, then seek the inspiration, but in other places, mm -hmm. you don't have to rehearse, you know, practice six hours more this day because, uh, oh man, the inspiration was the thing. Do something else because life is so much more than music and that's how we honor music i also if it makes sense i also hear from you that you're saying that you're not tying your complete identity and you're not tying all of your self-worth with how the music is going from your perception and i think that's that's a beautiful thing because once we start to tie that in then we start to think about it and by virtue of how you presented we have two sides this two-headed dragon you said and yeah. and in order to do the inspiration one must think a little but one must not think too much and so if we're thinking about ourselves and you've already talked about this you need to make it about other people exactly and if you think about yourself or begin to think about yourself then you also become afraid of making wrongs yes you become you can become afraid of failing which is super dangerous to music or any creative you know uh, process i think failing is so important i think you know as i said earlier also taking chances is super important because if you go out there and you play want to play the exact same thing you did yesterday because you want to be on the safe side then it won't have relevance for anybody including yourself. And so I think, you know, being less self-assertive or self, you know, focusing, that gives us more courage to try out things and be, you know, be comfortable with failing. And this is where Kenny's advice comes in against. It's only music. So even if you fail in one song or you go for this phrase or whatever, and it fails, well, in a minute, there comes another song or another phrase because music, Again, it's magic. It's written in the water. It disappears the instant we play it, then it's gone. So I think uh, it's very important to be, to feel brave, to take those chances, feel brave to, uh, to fail, basically, and to, you know, know that the world continues and still have a, a goal with our music. That is beautiful. And indeed, if we think about failures as not being failures, but we think about them as opportunities to learn, or indeed, as we've talked about a bit on this podcast, that especially for improvised music, when you make what you self perceive as a mistake, it can be a beautiful moment to leverage that into something new that you never would have found otherwise, because you just found a new path. What you think of as totally. being a mistake, you might have never gone there. Exactly. And, uh, well, it was, I think Miles Davis has been quoted, uh, probably a lot of musicians have been quoted that if you make a mistake, play it again. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, right. So, and, and the other thing that, you know, the other, um, like path of discussion when we open this subject is the fact that a lot of musicians, um, tend to be focusing on 
for instance, uh, practicing licks, you know, practicing um, like auto response, but with music. And again, to me, that's a very dangerous thing. I mean, yeah, it's possible to uh, check out and be able to play all Coltrane solos and have that in your fingers if you're a saxophone player. But you will never, ever sound like Coltrane because his music had so much more than just the notes. In fact, the notes was maybe the less important thing of his playing. His power and his conviction and his open heart, that's what I hear when I hear Coltrane. And the notes really was a, a tool to, to do that for him. But if, if I play his notes, it sounds like a sorry ass saxophone player trying to play Coltrane and it won't have any relevance to anybody. So, um, so I think that's a, it's, it's a quite a, an important topic in terms of, you know, music education that uh, a lot of education is, is still focusing on, you know, or educators or even, you know, students are focusing on getting as many licks in as possible, be able to play in all 12 keys or whatever. And I would say maybe go the op opposite direction, be able to play in any kind of weather or be able to play in any kind of light or, you know, trying to find paths that won't um, make your fingers do the same things that they did yesterday, mm. but instead uh, prepare your mind to always be open, searching for new musical structures, melodies, phrases that can create something new. Because I think the, that's where the stories are, are hidden. I would add one qualifier onto that, and is that we could use transcription and the act of transcription as an exercise to get our fingers to do other things that they don't typically do. But it's when we stay too long in that it turns into memorization and then regurgitation that it, it can become maladaptive. But we can use it just like playing totally. in the dark. We can use oh, yeah, it totally. as a tool to go through and exactly. develop new patterns and find exactly. new patterns. Exactly. And that's where what I said earlier comes in again. If you use it as a tool, yes. then if you go into the musical setting, forget about the tools. Yeah. So um, I totally concur with that. I love, you know, playing saxophone concertos or whatever, reading solos or whatever, but forget all about it when you go out there. Don't try to perform Coltrane's licks or, you know, that's putting on, the, on, 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 a, on a needle. But we, we don't want to hear you play Coltrane's licks. If you know them and your fingers know them, Fine, that's great because you have used them as a tool to know you uh, your instrument. And but when you get out there, be yourself, and that's where we also started this conversation. Be yourself at any given time, and sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's hard to show who you are, show all your weaknesses because that's a part of it as well. We every man, woman, every living person has a lot of weaknesses. There's a lot of things we can't do, and you can take the the best, you know, most prolific um, violin soloist in the world. And there's a lot of things he or she can do that goes for all of us. So what we can do is take our weaknesses and don't be afraid to show them to the world, show them in the musical settings, because that way we can also really show our strengths. And that's where it becomes uh, interesting. Well, we started this conversation with being yourself. We're going to end this conversation with being yourself. Benjamin Couple, thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for being so generous with your time, coming to hang out with me. Everyone, go check out. It's going to be B E N J A M I N K O P P E L dot com. Benjamin, I know you've got rehearsals to run to. You're such a busy and in demand guy. So thank you very much for squeezing us into your busy day. And I hope you have thank fantastic you so rest much of your day. for the invitation. Welcome back anytime. I would love to come back. Thank you so much for it.